Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Psych 3510. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about how we use z-scores in order to do some hypothesis testing, meaning make decisions about the real world. First, uh, we have to, though, break down how we do this calculation of a z-score. It's not a very difficult calculation. As we've said before in this class, the math is actually pretty easy. Uh, what's difficult about statistics is how we use the math to make decisions. So we're going to keep that in mind. We're not going to get worried about the math. Uh, what we are going to do is use the math to then learn how to make decisions about the world, which is actually the difficult part. So uh, if you can see my cursor right here, I can turn it into this fancy laser pointer. Uh, we are going to calculate a Z by taking an individual score, so a single person's score on any variable, right? This could be height, this could be weight. Uh, I think our example we've used previously in class is the number of fights that you get into in your relationship. Uh, this, this variable could be anything, but we have an individual's score and its distance from the mean of that variable divided by the standard deviation of that variable. So what this calculation ends up doing for us is giving us a ratio of how many standard deviations above or below the mean is a particular score. Now, this is valuable because it's going to help us decide how extreme this score is. So the number of standard deviations away from the mean tells us whether we have a typical score, meaning it is close to the mean and has very uh, a small amount of standard deviation away from the mean. But if a score is a very large number of standard deviations away from the mean, like two or three or four standard deviations, then it's going into the tails of our curve. It's becoming in a, a particularly extreme score. And just for some context, so that we remember why we care about extremity, right? we care about extremity because extremity helps us make decisions. We are convinced by extreme scores. We are not convinced by typical or common scores, right? So if you claimed that you were a tall person, but your height is at the average, then we should not believe your claim because you have a very typical score. But if you claim that you are a very tall person and your score is in the tail of the distribution, maybe you are three standard deviations above the mean, then we would consider you to be a tall person because you're six foot six or six foot eight, right? You are extremely tall. So we believe your claim that you are in fact tall. A property about z-scores uh, is that the sign, the positive or negativity of the z-score will tell us whether it's above or below the mean. A positive z-score is above the mean. A negative z-score will be below the mean. So let's do some just quick examples so that we can get familiar with the calculations before we start doing any decision making here. So it doesn't matter what this variable is, but here we have a distribution with a variable that has a mean of 20 and standard deviations of three, right above and below the mean. Let's imagine we have an individual with a score of 26. We want to know how far above or below the mean this score of 26 is. So we plug our raw score, which is our, our person, our individual with a score of 26, into x here. We plug our mean, which is 20, into the m here. And then of course we plug our standard deviation into the denominator. We end up with this formula, 26 minus 20, which is gonna give us a value of six divided by three. So this person is two standard deviations above the mean. Their score is 26. We had a mean of 20. That's two standard deviations of three. So they are right here. They are actually pretty extreme. Let's do another quick example to see the math below the curve. We have a score of 15. Oh, let me get my laser pointer back. We have a score of 15. So we plug them into X. 
we subtract 20. So you can already notice that in the numerator, we're gonna have a negative score, right? 15 minus 20 is gonna give me negative five. This is important because 15 is below 20. So it tells me that we're gonna be all over here on this left side of the curve, right? Whoever this is and whatever this variable is, they score low uh, or lower than the mean uh, at the population level. So we get a 15 minus 20, negative five divided by three gives us a score of negative 1.67. So they are roughly right here on the curve. Negative, less extreme than our standard than our z-score of two, which was two standard deviations above the mean. Uh, quickly, uh, a, another example of a maybe a particularly extreme score, right? We can actually um, theoretically go very far out here uh, or here on the positive or negative sides of the curve if we have an extreme score. So let's say that with a mean of 20 and a standard deviation of three, someone scores a seven, right? They are particularly low. Seven minus 20 is gonna give us negative 13 divided by three gives us a Z score of negative 4.33. So they are, sorry about that. They are right here on the curve. They are very extremely low. Again, let's keep in mind that what this is gonna help us to do is say, if this person, right, that is represented by this X claims to be extremely low on this variable, we need to know where they fall on this curve. If they fall in the middle of the curve, then they are typical. They're not extremely low. If they fall all the way out here, then maybe we are in fact convinced by their claim. Let's not lose track of the fact that this is about being convinced of people's claims or testing people's claims. Uh, so, Quickly, just algebraically, we can flip this formula around. And instead of solving for Z, we can solve for X. Now remember, X is the score of an individual. So if we know the mean and the standard deviation of any particular variable, and we know an individual's Z score, then we also know their raw score. So here, we're working with what looks like to be IQ, if I remember correctly, with a mean of 100 and a standard deviation of 15. So remember, X is the person's score. We don't actually know what this person got on the IQ test, but we know they have a Z-score of one and a half. And we know the mean is 100, and we know the standard deviation is 15. So with just a little bit of math, we can figure out their precise IQ score. So 1.5 times 15 plus 100 gives us 122.5, this person is right here on the curve, right? They are above the mean by a fairly substantial amount, one and a half Z scores. We can of course look below the mean again in the same way. Let's imagine someone has a Z score of negative 2.25. We plug that in as their Z. We plug in our mean of 100, our standard deviation of 15. We do a little bit of math. And it tells us that they have an IQ of 66.25, which is particularly low. And thus they are here on the curve, right? They are in the ex a pretty extreme low end of the curve. So we can move back and forth uh, between solving for Z and solving for X. But what we really want to understand is that this curve is, uh, allows us to say something about the percentage of people that are above or below a certain place on the curve. So imagine if you if someone told you, I have an IQ of 107, that's all well and good. Um, what are you supposed to think about that person, right? Are they extremely smart? Are they typical? Are they uh, extremely unintelligent? The curve allows us to make this judgment, this decision, right? This is where hypothesis testing comes in. It moves beyond simply the numbers and allows us to make a claim or test a claim about a particular individual. So this table tells us the percentage of scores 
that are beyond any score that we can find. Don't worry if that's a little confusing right now. We're going to do some examples, obviously. But what we want to do to use the table is to take our z-score and f look at its ones and tenths place. So a z-score of 1.7, for example, we would start here. And if the z-score was 1.70, we would use this value. If the z-score was 1.75, we would use this value. And the values on this table give us the percentage of scores that are more extreme or beyond our particular score or z-score. So if we have a z-score of negative 1.75, then the, the table returns a value of 0 0.0401. 0 we move the decimal point twice to turn this into a percentage. And so this tells us that 4.01% of scores are below, are more extreme in this direction than a score of 1.75 Z scores in the negative. Now, an interesting thing about this table is that we actually don't need a positive table. If you remember from last time, uh, the normal distribution is symmetrical. So all of these numbers apply to the positive side just as they apply to the negative side. So if someone is 1.75 right here, Z scores below the mean, then only 4% of people are lower than them, right? This, this depicts our sort of theoretical z-score, and the table returns this area of the curve, the number of people more extreme than them to the left. But if our z-score was positive 1.75, we would still use the same number, 4.01, but in our heads, we would have to recognize that the table is then talking about this area of the curve over here on the right, above the mean. So if we were 1.75 z-scores above the mean, we'd be right about here. And we would have 4% of people above them or greater than them. So this symmetry of the curve allows us to really only need one of these tables. We don't need a positive and a negative table. They are identical. So, a second example here is a z-score of negative or positive 2.63, so plus or minus 2.63, produces a value of 0 0.0043. We move the decimal twice again, and we can say that 0.43% of scores are more extreme than a z-score of 2.63, whether that z-score is negative or whether that z-score is positive. So this number, 0.43%, is an incredibly small number of people, right? If someone told you um, only 0.43% of people are taller than I am, then that means that this person is extremely tall. Or if only 0.43% of people are shorter than I am, it means that this person is extremely short. So 2.63 Z-scores in either direction is a very extreme score. Again, the table returns this value 0 0.0043 that represents this shaded area of the curve. So here we have some examples. Um, let's do one and then I'm going to ask you to, um, to, to try out the rest of them. Uh, actually, you know, let's do the first three and then I'm going to ask you to try out the next three. So um, let's find the percentage of scores greater than a z-score of 1.43. I'm going to walk you through it. So if our z-score is 1.43, then we need to look at this value on the table. We have a z-score of 1.4. We move over to 3 for the 100th place. And it tells us that, move the decimal twice, 7.64% of scores are greater than than a z-score of 1.43. If we move on, oh, sorry. Um, that would mean that our z-score of 1.43 is here. 
it tells me that everything to the right of this curve, right, all of this area to the right of this point of the curve amounts to 7.64% of people. Doesn't matter what my variable is. Height, weight, intelligence, doesn't matter. Let's do number two, 0.79. So first we find 0.7, which is kind of down here at the bottom of the table. We come all the way over to 0.79, right? 0.09, our hundredths place, to tell us that if our z-score is 21.48, or if, I'm sorry, if our z-score is 0.79, then 21.48% of people are more extreme or greater than our z-score. We are right here. We're a little more central, right? We're a little more typical, right? Because we're not as far away from the mean. And so that means more people are greater than us. Now it gets a little tricky when our z-score moves in the opposite direction of the question we're asking. So here we have a negative z-score, negative 2.11. But the question we're asking is if is how many people or what percentage of people are greater than our z-score. So if we think about what's gonna happen with a negative z-score, we're gonna move below the mean. So if we are below the mean, then more people are going to be greater than us, right? If the mean of an exam is 75 and you score a 65, then a lot of people are gonna be greater than you because you are below average. So first, what we need to do is find this value on the table, negative 2.11. So we're looking at a value of 1.74. 1.74 tells us this gray area of the curve up here. What percentage of people are more extreme than negative 2.11? If we're negative, then more extreme means more negative. But be careful because what we are asking about is how many scores are greater than negative 2.11. So we need the opposite side of the curve. We need the other side of the curve, not the side of the curve that the table gives us. So we're working on at the population level and the population has 100% of people. So if we want everything else on the curve, everything else to the right of the curve, then we need to take 100 minus 1.74, which tells us that if I have a z-score of negative 2.11, 98.26% of people are greater than me. So I suggest that you draw it out just like this on a curve, right? We are negative one, negative two, negative 0.11 z-scores. This red line, this vertical red line represents our individual, right? Our individual is particularly low on this variable. They are two, a little over two standard deviations below the mean. If they are this far below the mean, the table returns this small value of 1.74, which tells us the percentage of people more extreme than them. But we have to be careful. You cannot blindly just copy the result from the table because the question asks you how many people or what percentage of people are greater than this score. If this score is below the mean by a substantial amount, then it means a lot of people are above them. If the average score of, on an exam is 75 and you score a 50, then most people are above you, right? That number is going to be a large number approaching 100%. This person is so extremely low on this variable that 98.26% of people score greater than them. Okay, I'm gonna give you a minute. I want you to pause the video and I want you to try the next three, right? These three at the bottom, uh, what percentage of Z-scores are less than this, percent, this particular Z-score? So go ahead and pause the video. I want you to do these three calculations. Remember, draw out the curve and think about which side of the curve you're on and what the question is asking. And then we'll pick it up and look at the answers. So go ahead and pause and do that. Okay, I hope you're back. Uh, maybe you did it, maybe you didn't. Shame on you if you didn't. Uh, you have another chance to pause the recording and go back and do it after the guilt that I've given you. Uh, but I'm gonna assume that you have done the math uh, and that you have at least tried. And so we're gonna go forward 
with the answers. So with a z-score of 0.46, the table returns a value of 32.28. But remember, our question is what percentage of scores are less than our z-score? A z-score of 0.46 is above the mean, meaning that we're here where this vertical red line is, right? Uh, basically half of a z-score above the mean. The table returns this value of 32.28, which tells me how many people are beyond that z-score. And so if I take that number and subtract it from 100, it gives me my answer, which is how many people are below 67.72. Our second example is negative 1.57. The table returns a value of 5.82%. And that's our answer because our z-score is negative and it's moving in the same direction as our question, right? We're asking about less than, the z-score is negative. And so the table returns the percentage of scores less than, right? More extreme than our negative score. So we're here, the table returns 5.82, which represents this area of the curve, which is exactly what we want. We want the values less than our particular score. And lastly, 1.92, right? We're moving in an opposite direction of our question. The question is percentage of scores less than a z-score. We are above the mean which means we have to take the value 2.74 that the table returns and subtract it from 100 to give us the fact that if we are so far above the mean, it means that most scores are less than us, 97.26%. So all of this is so that we can make decisions, right? Let's imagine that I claimed I am extremely intelligent. You should not believe me, as we've discussed, right? You, I, If I make the claim, it is incumbent upon me to provide evidence of that claim. So you being a good little scientist, you demand that I show you proof. So I take an IQ test. I take an IQ test and I score 122. The mean of IQ is 100, the standard deviation is 15. So you can actually figure out exactly how extreme I am on intelligence. And let's say that we agree that if I'm in the top 5% of intelligence, then we will consider me extremely intelligent. This quote unquote top 5% is alpha, right? If you remember back to chi-square, if alpha was 0.05, what we're asking for is to be in the most extreme 5%. If alpha is 0.01, then we're asking to be in the most extreme 1%. So we have agreed that if I'm in the top 5% of intelligence, that will mean I'm extremely intelligent. So the first thing we wanna do is say that our null hypothesis, right? The nothing hypothesis is that I'm not extremely intelligent. We start from a place of not believing me and our research hypothesis is that I am extremely intelligent, right? So we're either going to fail or fail, we're either gonna reject or fail to reject the null and support or fail to support the research hypothesis. So we have all the data we need. Uh, we don't really have to do that much math. We take my 122, we plug it in for X. We take the mean, which is 100, we plug it into M. We take the standard deviation, which is 15, and we put it on the denominator. And we get my z-score of 1.47. Great, I'm right here. I'm above average intelligence. I look to be a, sort of in this uh, tail of the curve. I, it, it maybe looks good for me. I seem to be more intelligent than most people, but our line in the sand, right, was 5%. Am I in the top 5% or am I not in the top 5%? Because that's what we agreed upon. That was our alpha for our decision making. Well, luckily we have this table and it can tell us, as we just found, exactly what percentage of scores are more extreme than me. So if we look up my z-score of 1.47, remember I'm on the right side of the curve, I'm above the curve. 
So the value that it returns is 7.08%. What that means is 7.08% of people are more extreme than me on the positive side of IQ. So if this is me, this red vertical line, 1.47, roughly 7% of people are more intelligent than I am. If 7% of people are more intelligent than I am, then I cannot be in the top 5%, right? No, I'm in like the, the top 8% or 7%. So I didn't make it over my hurdle. I didn't pass over my line in the sand. And so we should conclude that while I'm above average intelligence, I'm not extremely intelligent as I claimed. Our APA style conclusion should say something like this. A Z test was conducted to see if Dr. Sell is, is extremely intelligent. We fail to reject the null, right? We are retaining, we're, we're hugging onto that null hypothesis and the evidence wasn't good enough. So we're gonna keep the null. We fail to reject it. And we conclude that I'm not extremely intelligent. Right? I did not make it across my decision-making barrier. Now this sort of begs the question, what score would I have needed to be in the top 5%? Well, the table can tell us that too, because the table can tell us at what point do I pass into the top 5%? And uh, it just so happens to be this point on the curve, 1.65 standard deviation. So if we see right here, 1.65 standard deviations is the place on the curve that just barely returns a value of below 5%. Now, when this value is below 5%, it means that that score of 1.65 standard deviations is in the top 5%. So had I been equal to or above 1.75 standard deviations, we would have rejected the null. I was almost there. I think it was 1.47. I was almost significant, but I wasn't. I was not significant, so we failed to reject. So this alpha of 0.05 establishes this line in the sand, and we can know exactly what it is with the z-score of 1.65. Now, we could take that z-score of 1.65 and figure out what IQ score I would have needed, right? So go ahead and do that. Using the algebraic formula from before, and you can find exactly the IQ score that I would have needed to be in the top 5%. So here we have a practice problem. This one is going to be in the negative direction. I want you to, uh, to take a look at this practice problem. See if you can answer the question, do the calculations, and then write up an APA style conclusion. If you click through, as I will do right now, I'm going to pause and let you try to do the calculations. So one, two, three, go, pause and do it. And we're back. And now let's run through our answer. So Julia claimed to be low on narcissism. We found her Z-score to be negative 3.33. We took her score of three. We subtracted it from the mean of eight. We divided by 1.5. And she is 3.33 standard deviations below the mean. It looks like... Julia is very unnarcissistic, just as she claimed. Our bottom 1% occurs right here at a z-score of negative 2.33. This is not Julia's score. This is the place that would put Julia in the bottom 1%, negative 2.33. So if we look at that in relation to Julia's score, Negative 2.33 is our alpha of 0.01. It puts her in the bottom 1%. Julia is beyond that. She is more negative. She is less narcissistic. And so we reject the null. We support Julia's claim. And we say that she is, in fact, very unnarcissistic. She is less narcissistic, much less narcissistic than the average person. So our APA style conclusion looks like this. We introduced the test, a Z-test was performed. We introduced the research question to assess whether Julia is low on narcissism. We in fact reject the null because she was 
uh, low enough on narcissism with a Z of negative 3.33 to be beyond our alpha point of 0.01. And we conclude that she is low on narcissism. So uh, there is a PowerPoint lecture posted on iCollege uh, that provides you with uh, more example practice problems and answers. Uh, I highly recommend that you go take a look at that and um, and answer those questions as this is exactly the type of thing that you will need to do for the exam. Uh, thanks, everybody. Uh, please feel free to email me and let me know if you have any questions, and I will be here to answer them as best and quickly as possible. Thanks, and uh, I will see you next time.